I'm talking about now. Now all I can see is chaos and confusion and panic. <laughs> Can you hear me? Great. So, this is my topic. Any questions? Okay, I'll tell you a little about it. I'll start by telling a little about myself. I'm currently working at the National Cybersecurity Center of the Finnish Communications Regulatory Authority, which is quite a mouthful. We were used to, uh, they used to know us by, as CERT FI, the National CERT. And before that, I was working with the Helsinki Police Department. So this is something that we've dealt with for a while now. Well, I've dealt with for a while, and everybody who's working with networks and their security has faced. So I'm about to tell you, uh, give you a broad picture of the topic as we saw it last year, the trends and the things that we saw, if you're interested. So I'll start, start by opening opening the concepts a bit, because when we talk about cybercrime, we're really talking about two different types of crime. We have uh, the crime in the digital realm, which means that there's crime on the internet, which is usually it's either cybercrime, which uh, requires the internet to be able to commit. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but if you catch my drift. And then there's cyber-enabled crime, which is like classical crime, uh, frauds, stuff like that, payment card information, theft, drug trade, uh, which utilizes the internet, but is, is not a new type of crime. So we see those both. So I'll talk a bit more about cybercrime, because cyber-enabled crime is, well, it's just crime. There's nothing really new about it. It's just not happening at the mall anymore. It's in the internet. So cybercrime is always changing, takes advantage of new technology. Usually they're the pioneers. They pick up the things first. So whenever you're going into a new service or a new area on the, on the internet, doing business or commerce or whatever, the criminals and scammers are usually there waiting already. And they're evolving methods to exploit old technology. And they're growing exponentially. It's almost... I think it's the fastest growing area of crime in the world right now. And as I said before, traditional crime is moving onto the web. And criminals, of course, they find networking opportunities. They meet each other online and they form criminal gangs that work over the borders, which are really international and multicultural and all that jazz. But security, well, everybody here knows that it's lacking and it's behind and we're doing our best, but the criminals always have the advantage that they're not bound by the rules. And they're usually first, and they're incentivized by money, which is amply available on the internet. So these are the broad topics that we saw last year. This is, of course, not everything that we saw, but these are the top trends off the top of my head that are usually, usually the things that we're talking about when we talk about cybercrime. And as you can see, there's not very much high-tech stuff here, because I'm talking about mass crime, the stuff that actually bothers you and the ones you love and your old grandmother in the cottage in the wilderness. So it's basically pretty low-tech stuff. And we can start with the lowest of the techs, which is CEO fraud. To say, essentially, well, it's hard to hack stuff. No, because if it wouldn't be hard, we wouldn't be special people, would we? So the easiest way to get money from a company is just to send them an email and ask for money. That doesn't really work, so you have to say that you're the big boss. So you're, you'll send, them, send your accounting a message and ask for them to do a transfer to, say, China. Not to name any country, but it's usually China. And they uh, use spoofed email addresses for this stuff. It's very low tech. And I'm, I was kind of surprised when this popped up, because this is really, really ingenious. It's, it's the easiest way that you can get money, is just give them your bank account number and tell them that you should d deposit this amount to this address. And how is this possible? Well, companies don't utilize SPF records. 
or any other technologies that would stop somebody from sending email that spoofs their domain. So it could look really legitimate. And if you have a big company, you have a lot of uh, different servers that send mail on your behalf, so it can be a bit tricky to stop this. And when I say low tech, I mean it's really low tech. This is a PHP web page that you can go to, and you can spoof your email address where you're sending from and to, and you can even attach files, which is handy if you want to send out ransomware or whatever. And as you can see, you can donate Bitcoin for all this fun. And I've seen this used in actual crime, and I've seen people fall for it. So it doesn't even take very much. And the losses, they're staggering. I counted down, uh, checked some sources, and 230 billion, it's with a B, it's a thousand million dollars in the US alone in the past three years. I would quote a source, but I forgot to copy paste the link, so it's not there. But you can Google this up and make your own calculations, but I think that should be a bit accurate. So what can you do, basically? This is not a technological problem, so there's no technological solutions that's gonna stop this from happening. You have to train your people and you have to detect it. Okay, you can use SPF records, but then the criminals can register lookalike domains or some other domains that look like the compet competitors' domains. So training your key personnel, the people who pay bills, who have access to your bank accounts, your company's bank accounts. It's very important that they know that when the CEO who sits in the next room sends you an email in English asking you to deposit 200,000 to a Chinese bank account, you could just walk over and ask why. Uh, chances are he doesn't even know he sent that email. And he doesn't know anybody in China either. Well, everybody loves this one. Who's got a friend or a relative who's had ransomware? One? Really? Okay, so nobody has friends. Because <laughs> I've seen this happen a lot. Because this is basically the evolution of malware. Like what we're trying to do when we attack other users. This is the, the capitalist answer to that. How can I leverage the most money out of running software on somebody's computer? And uh, to sound poetic, our lives are so connected to our computers now that essentially everything's there. And nobody knows what a backup is. Outside this room, of course, we all have state-of-the-art backup systems at our home that are absolutely impervious to any malware. But this comes in kind of a, um, two flavors, if you will. There's the opportunistic, which comes as a document attached to an email coming from somebody you don't know or somebody you do know. As we learned, it's easy to spoof those addresses and it will encrypt your hard drive and ask for one Bitcoin, which depending on the day could be anything from $200 to $20,000. So it's usually one Bitcoin or half a Bitcoin if they're not feeling very greedy. And they just encrypt everything on your hard drive. So when you pay, you might get a key back. But they, they have a customer promise attached to this. They try to achieve a certain quality of service with their crimes. So usually when you send that email, uh, I mean, you pay that money, you actually do get the key back. But don't tell anybody because I don't want you to pay. But usually it could be that you don't get it. So it's sold even as a service. There used to be a website where you can go and package your own ransomware with your custom message and then send it out. And the guy who made this service takes a cut. So it's great, kind of. But how it arrives on your computer, it's JavaScript in an attachment, PDF, Office, basically anything that you use to get malware on your computer. So any vector, really. And they've been targeting this to companies, and uh, when you target this to a company and you attack the server infrastructure, the damages are naturally a lot ho bigger than one simple computer. And the ransom demands usually reflect this. And they're tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. And a lot of the victims pay, because that's the easiest way to get out of it. And then they go and buy backup systems. This is one of the worst user interface mistakes of our time because that button might as well say, fuck my life up. Because usually we all click it all the time because everything you download from a shared 
drive at your work or whatever says that you have to enable content to print, which I don't understand why. Why? But anyway, when you enable content, you're in trouble. I think Mikko said something like this also. I don't know if he did yesterday, but seen and said it. So this is what happens. Well, the biggest problem with ransomware being profitable is basically that you have to pay with Bitcoin. And paying with Bitcoin is complicated, at least. And this wall of text here is your ransom note. And half of it is instructions on how to get Bitcoin. First, you download and install a Tor browser. And after a successful installation, run the browser, wait for initialization, type in the address bar. There's an address. You have a personal page. You have personal codes here. Some of these even have chat rooms that you can ask for help. It's capitalism anyway. The best ransomware is the one that you know that if you pay, you get your files back. I'm just waiting for the hardcore branding here. That it's, your <laughs> it's a customer promise. You get everything you pay for. It has a Wikipedia link to what RSA is, in case you want to really drive deep into what's happening on your computer right now. And it's going onto the servers now, because uh, just a few, few weeks ago, we noticed that a lot of the MongoDB instances installed online are there without any authentication at all. It, for some reason, took people months to notice that there's about 60,000 of those there. So, okay, you can insert stuff into a database, uh, you can read stuff from a database, or you can encrypt the whole database and ask for ransom. So this MO is really spreading out to different levels, from the home user to company infrastructure to individual servers. And I just today noticed a tweet by a guy who <laughs> posted this picture. There's a bunch of Elasticsearch instances encrypted. And there you can all see, send 0.2 bitcoins to this wallet. So this is not even very expensive. You can get your, all your data back. And then we move on to the digital breaking of Windows, which is DDoS, which also is the worst crime. It's the, well, worst as in the easiest to do. So everybody I expect everybody knows essentially what DDoS is, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway. It's distributed denial of service attack. It's essentially you get, you get a bunch of people standing in the doorway so nobody can get into the shop. So that's a DDoS attack, but just put it on the internet. You generate traffic to a website so it doesn't work anymore, so the legitimate queries don't go through. And you can buy this as a service. So if you have mummies, credit card, and you have an address to a service, you can just swing that away and kill down those nasty servers that your competing team is using on whatever the game is that the kids are playing these days. Because that's, that's essentially what they usually do. They're usually small, targeted at single IP addresses. But every once in a while, something funny happens, and somebody gathers a lot of service, um, a lot of compromised hosts, which, thanks to Internet of Things, is starting to get a lot easier than it used to be. And they can take, take down really big providers and cause really big havoc, because we have these single points of failure on the internet that are susceptible to this. And the way to mitigate DDoS is it's always you have to see what the attack profile is like, and then start filtering traffic, maybe cut down countries. If most of the attacks are coming from Latin America, you can, you can drop those. It basically happens on the ISP level. It's pretty hard to prevent this because you want people to come, come to your website from everywhere, from at all times and all hours. And kids have noticed that. But it's not destructive, which is good. It's not as such a threat to information security in the system. It just denies access to it. And it's time constrained. It's going to go away in a few hours, days, or weeks, depending on who's attacking and why and how hard. Usually mitigation eff efforts will help. So if you can identify the source of the traffic, you can cut it out and resume business as usual. But again, we come to the single points of failure, like um, a couple of years ago, all the ATM machines dropped 
off the grid because there was a technical detail that caused that when another service was DDoSed, which was not even something that the people who were attacking were aiming for, but it's just a happy surprise. So at 6, 6 p.m. on the evening of New Year's Eve, people couldn't get cash out of the machines. So you can, you can imagine what's that like. You want to get drunk, but you can't. But, okay, well, Internet of Things, I've seemed to have typoed this in anger, because this is, this is what's really fueling the DDoS market now, because we have all these kinds of devices. Because we have, now we have, like, basically, well, the desktop operating systems are pretty good. Pretty good, especially this MacBook here, it's very good. And then you have some Windows and Linux boxes, which are okay, I guess. But the Internet of Things takes us back like 16, 17 years. And we have devices that have the same attacking capability on the DDoS realm as your computer, because it can use the whole outgoing bandwidth of your own Internet connection. And you won't even notice it's doing it, because it's your ADSL modem, and how often we ask how you're doing, and check the logs or see if it's been owned. And there's enough of these devices. There's, uh, I don't have the numbers, but I'm guessing billions, and they're being sold all the time, more and more. And everybody, everything needs to be connected, everything needs to have an IP address. And when one of those, uh, I think if you could call those egress devices, but uh, dev uh, devices that are on your LAN, that have an open listening port, are compromised, then your home LAN is compromised, because who's treating it as hostile? Who's sharing files in their internal networks with no credentials? I think a lot of people are. Well, nobody here, of course, but some people are. So I think we're going to see a trend of ransomware leveraging the Internet of Things, encrypting the contents of your NAS without your computer even making a beep. Just one day you notice that everything's encrypted. That's going to suck for a lot of people. So they're computers, and computers suck. They have open services, de debugging back doors, default credentials you can't even change. You could change maybe the web, uh, the web page credentials that you have when you log in to configure the device, but then there's Telnet open with the same default credentials that don't get changed. And then the Telnet port is open to the internet. And this is how we get uh, malware families like Mirai. Uh, know how to pronounce it in English, so I'll say Mirai, like in Finnish. And they, they can gather a lot of attacking power. And every one of those networks is compromised when the ADSL modem is compromised. And UPnP helps here, because if, even if you block ports, software or devices can open ports, so they can, ask, they can listen in. And I think this is just me thinking, but I think uh, the problem might be that these devices are trying to act as servers that are being hosted by people who don't understand anything about servers, whereas they should be clients just calling out, not exposing any ports to the Internet. But then they need the infrastructure of the maker of the device that would faci facilitate the communication between, say, a mobile app and the device that you have at home, which some devices do, and they're not such a problem anymore. But when you start running servers that you don't know what they do, you could be, could be a part of a botnet. And back to low tech, so phishing. Essentially, phishing is nicely asking you to give me your credentials. Because it doesn't really matter how good our locks are and how good the guys picking the locks are, because I can always politely go and ask for the key. It's sort of a social engineering attack where you pose as somebody else. Well, we've, I think, at least all of us have seen these, what happens, uh, what kind of messages the phishing messages are. And you can have these in the targeted or the opportunistic flavor also. So I think the low tech is the new high tech here. So I've intentionally cut off the URL bar here, but this is what a phishing website looks like. There's really no way to tell if this is real or not, unless you, get, you notice the URL up there. Well, now you can, of course, but 
if when the user arrives on this page, usually in a state of panic and alarm because the message that they get will try to cause that emotional state in you so that you abandon all reason and type in your credentials right there. That's why they usually tell you that there's a, there's a great hurry. I know it's Friday afternoon, sir, but you have to log in now and change something because otherwise your iPod will explode, <coughs> something like this. And people react and they go and they give their credentials and then they're naked on the internet. And uh, well, we used to be in a pretty good, pretty good state here in Finland because our language is really complicated. There's like five people who speak it proficiently. And I don't think most of those even understand what the other one is saying. So you can, you can understand the frustration of the Eastern European attacker when he wants to fish the Finnish customer and he's trying to decode and decrypt and understand how I'm going to write this message and it usually comes out as comical garbled nonsense, which is enough to fool <laughs> a surprising amount of people. But, but anyway, there you go. And then you sometimes you get legitimate emails that are almost as bad. So <laughs> essentially you have to develop this internet spider sense to tell, wait a minute, am I being fucked with or is this legit? Usually the answer is yes. Yeah, I know. Which one? <laughs> but this is the world we live in now. Thanks, computers. Well, data breaches. This is cybercrime too, and this is usually, and this can be a precursor to worse cybercrime. So you want those credentials. But as we all know, there are very secure ways to store those, cre those credentials in databases, like MD5, which is perfect. Let anybody tell you anyway, anything else. It's a joke. But a lot of that stuff is there just for the taking. Like you have a database, you have credit card numbers, you have social security numbers. Everything you type on a computer goes to the internet, goes to a database, and it usually just stays there. And when you delete something, they just set the flag that says deleted. It's still there. So data breaches are very great. If you're interested in amassing a lot of information, about a lot of people. And when you combine these two, these two, okay, Anthem, it's a big social security conglomerate in the US, and then you have Adult Friend Finder, and then you have FBI, and then you find one email address from all three of those. And that's, that can be interesting if you're targeting somebody. So the basic rule of thumb is that if you really don't want it to be public one day, probably not a good idea to put it on the internet. But of course, we always have to do that. We have to do stuff on the internet that we don't want to go public. But just keep that in your mind that someday this might be a part of a data breach and all this shit that I wrote about Trump on Facebook is being read by Trump. So use unique passwords. It's an easy rule to say out loud and really hard to enforce. Because uh, we've had data leaks in Finland. We had this one game called Alupa, which is in English I translated as smarty head or something like that. It's a game where you go and answer a bunch of questions. It's a trivia game and feel really smart about yourself. So if you want to use a nickname in it, you have to register yourself. And of course, the creators of the game weren't the most security conscious people of the world. So they thought that storing this password plain text is fine. Who cares about their Alupa password? But then again, it shows that people are people and they can remember one word or two words and maybe one password. So they use the same password everywhere. And this data breach happened, I think, over five years ago, if I'm not incorrect. Again, I don't have the numbers here. I'm not much of a numbers guy, but I think it was five years ago. And they still are using those combinations of nicknames, email addresses, and passwords to crack people's services. So even if you don't care about your Alipa account, you don't have to if you're using a unique password and, and using a password manager, which is the only sane way to do this thing. And of course, use encryption. But can we trust encryption? Does encryption work? Does WhatsApp have a backdoor? Does the NSA open all our communications and with great gusto read all the details that we write to our wife about the next day's groceries, possibly. So 
OPSEC. There's a few. Uh, there's a scroll bar at the right side, which you don't see, which is about two millimeters tall. So this goes on and on and on. And as you can see, there's eBay, JP Morgan Chase, Anthem, Target, Yahoo, all the Turkish citizens. Like this is, this is just the biggest ones gathered here. Deep. Red is bad, blue is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the red ones are an interesting story. Because in, in this sea of stuff, only some of the stories are interesting. Well, the target one is pretty interesting, because they went into a HVAC system. They had an internet-connected device. Uh, kind of an IoT device, actually, it, uh, used to control their air conditioning. And that was connected to the same network as their point of sale system. So they were able to crack that HVAC system because it had poor auth authentication, and they were inside the perimeter which, from which they could pivot to the point of sale systems and install malware there and get all the credit card numbers that they would like. I think it's when start thinking about, okay, 70 million credit card numbers. What I'm, uh, what's a criminal going to do with those? Well, they start markets. They put up a web page and they sell them in packs of a thousand. And they have customer service and they have hotlines and they compete on the quality of the cards that they have. They check them out that they're actually legit. And the end user goes up and buys maybe, I don't know, 50 credit cards, pays a few dollars and then uses those stolen credit cards, thus assuming most of the risk of getting caught. And when you use Tor browser, the Tor network for all this stuff, the guy who actually stole those 70, 70 million credit cards, he's not, not really exposed anymore. So he can profit all of, off of this stuff. And in the end, it's the end, end user of those cards who's gonna get a visit from the police someday. So malware, well, point of sales malware, essentially. I don't have a malware part here because I'm talking about crime, not about technology. Um, so this point of sales malware and skimming is just a way to get credit cards. Skimming is essentially the art and craft of reading your credit card number off the magnetic stripe when you go and use a machine that you stick your card into. And we've been moving a bit more towards using the chip but you still have to stick your card almost fully in into most of these machines. And if I'm not incorrect, it checks the orientation of the card by reading the magnetic drive. So you can't just go home and swipe a magnet over it and be safe from skimming. Because they thought about that and said, <laughs> not like that, too easy. So malware on payment systems, they store this information and they send it out to the criminals using whatever, whatever way they can. DNS requests is a good way, because port 53 is open. You can go there. And physical access points, always a risk. So whenever you go to an ATM, just give the card slot a good tug. If it stays on your hand and there's another one beneath it, call the police, don't touch anything, and say it wasn't me. I'm sure they'll believe you. <laughs> it's usually used in Eastern European crime gangs. Again, at least the ones that got caught could be that there's a Western European crime gang that's just so much better that <laughs> we never catch those guys. <laughs> but they clone these cards and they use, use them abroad. I won't go very deep in this because this is a whole world and I, if you're interested, Brian Krebs has a great article about skimming with pictures that will blow your mind. And then there's of course the ATM hacks using remote access where you can just infect the device with malware, and then at a certain point, use your code to make it spit out money, like it's payday. And usually it's not the hacker that goes there and picks up the money from the ATMs, he sells access to it. And he tell, uh, you go online on the Tor network, naturally, and then you buy access to an ATM, and the criminal sells you a time slot and gives you a pin code. And then you walk up to the ATM at 
12.59 Eastern European time, and then you type in your PIN code and <laughs> spits out money for you. Again, the guy who actually gets the cash carries all the risk, and the guy who hacked the ATM, he just sells access, so he's pretty well protected. But OPSEC, I've said it's hard. That's not true. It's impossible. So some, some of these people, if you look hard enough, they will slip and they will get caught. Because at least some of these Russian guys, they like cars. And when they have a lot of money, they buy new cars. And then they post pictures of themselves on car forums using the same username they use on the hacking service. And then they have license plate numbers there. And big stocky guy in a leather jacket, look at my Mercedes, it is very legit. And then they get, <laughs> then they get caught. Because they, they don't really, well, I think in the underground hacking world, your, well, not underground, black hat, criminal hacking world, your name is really what's important for you because it's, uh, it's your brand. And a lot of these guys like to hang on to their nicknames gain some notori notoriety, what a hard word, notoriety. Okay, I'll look it up later. They like to <laughs> gain some name for themselves so that they're the big guy on hack forums or whatever. So that's an OPSEC fail for you. Just use a random number and change it all the time, but then you can't give you the Igor promise of very good malware. So we've been seeing Bitcoin pop up every once in a while. And there's a very good reason why it's there, because uh, you can't pay ransom in small unmarked bills from Finland to Liberia. So you have to use something that will use the internet. So Bitcoin is anonymous. Not really, but kind of. It can be if it's being used anonymously. But it's also the most trackable currency in the world. because everything's public. You can just go and see where the cash flows go. It's not regulated, but of course, it's valuable, depending on the day. It's non-refundable, which is great. Once you put the money out there, it stays there. And it's perfect for criminal use. It's essentially digital cash. There are a lot of people who say it's perfect for even legitimate uses. I'm sure it can be in the future when they work out the kinks, for example, how to use it, because even the criminals need to send you to a Wikipedia article and give you three pages of instructions. And then they have to give you 48 hours to do that. And even so, then, most people can't, can't just wrap their heads around Bitcoin just to pay one ransom. But I'm sure this will evolve. And dealing in cryptocurrency also has its inherent risks, which is devaluation. Well, it can also rapidly appreciate in value, as we've seen uh, during the last few weeks when it bumped up to over $1,000 and then went back to, I think, what's the current price today? Maybe 700 800 something like that. It fluctuates a lot. And of course, fraud, theft of funds, non-refundable, so it's easy to steal. Once you have it, you can keep it. Nobody can come and get it back from you. And a lot of these payment providers that try to take the burden of dealing with Bitcoin directly, which, by the way, involves downloading, I think, a 90 gigabyte blockchain on your own computer. And they get hacked all the time. So if you're interested in this, there's a blockchain graveyard, which you can go and see all the Bitcoin payment providers that have gone, come and gone, and the collected explanations on what happened. Because when you have all those bitcoins and you're doing like, uh, okay, I'll give you this and I'm, I'm selling this stuff and I'm working as a mitigator in this process, you can just turn off the servers and grab all the money and run and say, we got hacked, man. Sorry, nothing we can do about it. Because yeah, we have backups, but you know the money's gone, so I guess I'm going to just live in Japan now and tend cats. This is very telling because as a police officer, um, I investigated a bunch of these cyber crimes, and this is a really insulting stereotype because half of the guys were obese. But, but this is not entirely true, because uh, now we, we can see that the actual criminal organizations are trying to find, find the opportunities in cybercrime and in 
in Bitcoin especially, so when you're running like old school sc scamming sc schemes and stuff like that, it's, it's pretty easy to launder cash with Bitcoin. You can just make it disappear. You can carry it in a USB key on a chain on your neck, like I have here. It's not doesn't have Bitcoin in it, but or other secrets. Leave me alone. But so the guy with the MC vest there, he might also know very well what Bitcoin is, and the stereotypical nerd at the end, he might be working for him. So they're finding each other. It's beautiful, really. So we had a few notable cases at the Helsinki Police Department. I'll just go through them very briefly, because I only have like 10 minutes left. So we had one Finnish hacker, Ryan, using his nickname out of courtesy, courtesy to his family. He owned, uh, well, I wrote sites, but that's not true. He owned uh, about 50,000 servers. Uh, he was running a botnet with a hacking group called Hack the Planet. We caught him and we investigated the case and he got a two year suspen suspended sentence after a lot of investigation. And then we had two homegrown fishers that ran an operation in 2014 and they sent people text messages. It was a very novel avenue because nobody trusts email really anymore. They're, they know how to be suspicious about weird emails, but when you get an SMS message from a collections company that you owe us 36 do, uh, euros and 21 cents, please log into our website at Perintapalvelu, which means collections company, and give us your banking details and you will receive a text message asking for a confirmation code. So in real time, these people were sending these messages, they set up the website, they weren't really hackers, it was made in PHP. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> PHP is fine, I make stuff with PHP. And, uh, I like to play with it, my children, you know, it's great. So targeted Finnish bank customers and they got instant loans. They really didn't, didn't care how much money you have on your account. Just a few people lost money from their account, but you can have 20 euros on your account. If your credit rating is fine, you can get an instant loan for 5,000 euros. And the instant loan company doesn't get the information about your bank account from the bank. It gets it from you when you're applying for it. So what you do is you go to Eastern Helsinki. You notice a trend with East and crime. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but when you go to Eastern Helsinki, you can find a drug addict and you can take him to your home and put him on a computer and get his banking credentials and tell him that there's going to be 5,000 euros on your bank account. You can keep 500 and send the rest here. And then they'll do that and in a couple of days weeks or months, the police will arrive and ask about that transaction. But you get 500, hey, that's great. Cracks cheap. And they made a, about a half a million in profits, of which they took some and invested in Bitcoin, naturally. And then they got seven years in prison, and I think when they're out, Bitcoin's gonna be worth 100,000. So they're gonna be rich guys. And then there's... Uh, good example of people who found a vulnerability and didn't really know what to do about it. So this was, this was kind, of a, kind of an example that got the police a lot of bad press, but the police were sort of in a situation that they had no other choices. They had to start investigations. So these guys, they found a vulnerability in a system, a really stupid one. Uh, you could print out your application for start a funding or something like that. And there's, a, again, a PHP file with a question mark and ID equals and a number. And when you increment that number, you get the next one and the next one and the next one. So the thing you do when you notice like this is what? Well, of course, you write a Python script and you download all those things on your computer and then call it proof of concept. And then you copy it to your buddies who do the same. And then you get get kind of nervous and then you call the company and say, well, we found this thing and then you contact the National Cyber Security Center and then the owners, they were less than amused, take us and they, they filed a criminal report about it. So the Helsinki PD went and investigated the case. And just recently they realized that there weren't actually any damages. Okay, information was accessed that wasn't supposed to, 
but there weren't any damages, so we're dropping the case. So this is a good example of responsible disclosure done wrong, because uh, skip step two, you're golden. And even some companies, they'll pay you a nice sum called a bug bounty. They get some money for your trouble. We won't, though. <laughs> but we won't put you in jail if you do that, so. You can always tell the NCSC if uh, your secrets are safe with us. So thank you. Any questions? Okay, so, um, well, we saw lots of types of crimes, but what about insider crimes? Good question. That's really... Well, insiders have access to information, don't they? So they don't need to break into anything. So you have people... Well, what about insider crime? <laughs> How many? You were never reported any? Uh, well, a lot of that stuff happens, sure, but uh, it usually didn't come down to the Helsinki Police Department Cybercrime Division because there was usually just fraud or stuff like this, and other departments uh, investigated those crimes, so I'm, I'm not really current on those. We had a few cases where people were stealing information from the company that they were working on, and we had to do forensics on their computers to find that information. Usually it was a USB key on their desk, so it wasn't that sophisticated, if I understand your question. Yeah, well, let me just enlarge it a little bit. So many companies, if they act responsibly, have internal procedures that are supposed to prevent a single person from committing this type of a crime. So have you had cases where these rules were breached or the rules were inadequate or...? Inadequate, sure. Because uh, a lot of the companies, well, I'll give you an anecdote. Uh, we had an investigation where the head of finances was suspected of defrauding the company for hundreds of thousands of euros. And when we looked into it, she was, before that position, she was fired from another company where she was the head of finances where she stole hundreds of thousands of euros. So, uh, <laughs> so it, it, you just have to do a background check to find this out. So, okay, you're interested in managing this purse, then just do a background check. You'll find that out. And of course, internal, uh, how you watch the people that work for you depends on what you do and what your internal systems and checks are. And a lot of, uh, a lot of companies are watching internal logs and trying to catch insiders. But it's, it's next to impossible because you can't really compartmentalize that much and everybody has to have access to the information that they need to do their job and if they decide to put it all in a USB key and flee to Russia, uh, that's easily doable. So there's really no answer to that. Yeah, there's one more. Okay, so uh, you talked about skimming, which is taking the magnet stripe and so on. Are there any documented cases of copying the RFID of a credit card? Which, in my opinion, is inherently insecure. I mean, Mythbusters tried to do an episode of this, and they got an interesting phone call. Everyone can look <laughs> it up, but yeah. Are there any yeah. documented cases of this yet? Uh, not that I know of in Finland. I've seen a video where a guy goes in a subway with one of these handheld payment devices and goes like this on people's butts and gets blip 20 euros there, blip 20 euros there. Yep, seems the same. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's very viable because that's pretty, uh, pretty laborious and there's a hard limit on how much you can pay on that RFID. So when it's, it's 25 euros in Finland. Yeah, so if it's that little, it's not worth the trouble because you can just send an email and ask for 10,000 and they'll send it to you. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>